welcome to Drinks Coach, episode 106. I'm starting to lose count. After a little break, I've been judging the International Wine Challenge, which was fun, because I earned some money. Woo! Isn't that a novelty? Um, and also, I've been seeing my mum, who's been over from Sweden, which is nice, and talking all things wine with her, because she's the reason I'm here. Um, yeah, lowercase, Drinks Coach UK, lowercase, Vine Sack. Uh, you are watching. The Drinks Coach UK on YouTube, uh, hit the bell um, and uh, then you'll get notifications and so forth. Um, it'd be really nice to have some more subscribers. Um, so today, guess what today is? Today is World Sauvignon Blanc Day. So shall we get on with it then? Okay, right. So uh, thank you very much to Anita Jackson at Wines of Chile and uh, the um, mega super group that she's managed to create with Wines of uh, New Zealand and wines of South Africa, and thank you for sending me samples. They sent me, uh, I think it was about 12 wines. I had about five other Sauvignon Blancs in the rack. I tasted them all, uh, and I've picked the six that I kind of want to show, really, uh, plus one, which I'll tell you about at the end. Um, so, uh, yeah, without further ado, where should we start? What do you think? Spin, spin, spin the wheel of justice. What do you reckon? France, South Africa, Chile. Let's start with Chile. Let's start with Chile. Okay, so... Um, as I try to do with these things is I try to make it slightly entertaining and slightly informative and educational at the same time. So, uh, that's chilli. There we go. Chilli. Big red thing. Okay. Look how big it is. Look how long it is. And also, the wine bit is only the middle third, which is already like 14 hours drive from one end to the other. Um, where that little dot is, is uh, Santiago, which is the capital of Chile. And where that crosses is where these two wines come from okay let's try and just zoom in slightly thank you very much emma wifey for my fantastic analog high high res uh, graphics today um there's the cross it's slap bang in the middle of a place called casablanca valley yeah casablanca sounds like a dope bogard film a duck whoever it was yes um but it's not, and it's not in Morocco. Uh, Casablanca, uh, I suppose, means white slopes or white house. No, white house, isn't it, Casablanca? And there's a little bit of chilli, he says, having dropped the map. There is a bit of chilli where a lot of Sauvignon Blanc is grown. You think about how much land is given over to red wine production, mostly, um, and quite a lot of white as well, I suppose. Um, this area here, which is kind of a, a conglomerate of little areas called uh, San Antonio Valley, uh, Casablanca Valley, um, Leda Valley, thank you very much for remembering that quickly. Um, but also there's a little blob down here which has recently been discovered. It's kind of a circular mountain, sort of hill look, which has um, access to the sea. Uh, it's very, very exposed to the breezes of the Pacific Ocean. A place called Lolol, uh, which I think also is capable of making very nice Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so really what we're talking about here is um, the opportunity on this wonderful day, World Sauvignon Blanc Day, to explain kind of differences. And, and if you like one, will you like the other? You know, what is it about X that makes you maybe want to try Y? Or indeed, what's different about them, which I think is more important. Let's start off with our two chilli wines. So we have one of the first, white, well, first wines I ever bought from chilli were the wines of Carmen. And they're a very, very good producer. Not that one, not that one. Where are we? Not him, not her. Oh, yes. And then we have Ritual Sauvignon Blanc. There we go. The um, reason why I've picked these two is because um, this is 2020, standard, drinking Sauvignon Blanc very young. I'll explain why. And then this one, 2017, mm, which I think was a cool vintage. Um, cool both ways, I think, for white wines. So uh, let's just pour the first one and start talking about chilli in general. Okay, so chilli is a long streak of piss like that, isn't it? And it's got the Pacific Ocean on one side where the Coriolis, Coriolis effect is putting up cold air from the Antarctic. And on the right hand side, on the eastern side, there's a very long, the longest in fact, mountain range in the world called Andy. And uh, when the sun goes in, the temperature of the air cools and it rolls down the hills. And we call this cold air drainage, which causes a lot of wind, but it also allows very, very warm, very, very ripe, very sunny aspects where you're getting blazing sun and lovely ripe fruit. It allows those grapes to cool overnight and it drops the temperature vastly, keeping a lot of the freshness, but maintaining a lot of ripeness at the same time. So generally speaking, if I was going to put Chilean Sauvignon Blanc, as we know it, you know, Casablanca-ish Sauvignon Blanc, into the firmament of Sauvignon Blancs. Um, it's not as nettly 
and crisp as, let's say, a cool climate Touraine or Sancerre Sauvignon from France, or indeed from somewhere like our tray in, in, in Marlborough, which is a sub-area of Marlborough, um, the great big place in New Zealand where they grow a lot of Sauvignon Blanc, uh, where they have a nat natally net kind of edgy crunchiness to them. Um, these wines tend to have more of the the brine, more of the sea breeze about them. They smell like often of oyster shell, I think, and that's partly climate and partly soil. Um, uh, this is the Carmen Gran Reserva. Uh, all prices will be in the legend below if you look on the computer rather than watching on telly, which most of you hopefully are, so you can see properly. 12.5% um, alcohol, so it's not a blaster in any way. This, I think, is a great success. A lot of um, Chilean Sauvignon Blanc, I think, tends to be on the little bit on the ripe side, on what the experts call the thiole side, a bit of hairsprayish. Um, passion fruit, slightly artificial sweets character. I like these wines to have ripeness, but I want them also to have that slightly salty, briny, sharp edge, which, I mean, if you're not drinking Sauvignon Blanc on its own just to quench your thirst, its other main purpose in life is to be served with shellfish, uh, whether it's oysters or whether it's prawns or whatever. And there's a place on the coast, very close to where we are here, um, in Valparaiso, a place called El Chiringuita, in Zapayar, which is the Mines playground of uh, of Chile. It's kind of like the Hamptons of Chile. Uh, and there's a place called El Chiringuito, which means the little bar on the beach where they do the most amazing hot seafood just comes out of the oven all day. And drink stuff like this, you wouldn't want to ever move anywhere ever again. So I've got a lot all this brininess happening. I can taste it, almost taste saline, in the way that Fino Sherry tastes slightly salty. But it doesn't taste oxidised like sherry. It's got a lovely passion fruity, um, green star fruit. Now, I don't know if you've ever eaten a star fruit and gone, that tastes of absolutely nothing, because that happens in England a lot. But when you eat star fruit in a country which grows it, it can actually taste quite nice. So the carambola fruit, the green star fruit, has a lovely green tang, like green mango. And that's what this wine has. It's not packed full of concentrated flavour. It's not sort of sharply intense, so as it would wake you up if you're feeling tired. More it kind of cuddles you. It's a bit more, more languid than that. It's a bit more laid back. And would be absolutely fantastic with all sorts of seafood and shellfish, lobster and that sort of thing. So it has a ripeness, but also it has a, 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 a pliability. It's not hard like some New World Seven Blancs can be. Okay, numero uno. Let's put that there. Inside. Let's try the next one. So this isn't a, a, um, a wine that I'm particularly familiar with, but I, I just took to it because it's a Vina Casablanca wine. It's three years older. When you're buying wine from New Zealand, for example, and you go to a shelf and you see, I don't know, Brancott Estate or Villa Maria, some of the really, really well-known, really big brands. If I was to see on a shelf of 2017, I would stay well clear. In fact, I would stay well clear of anything that didn't say 2020 or 2021. Because these wines are designed to give of all of their power and all of their fruitiness and all their primary zing, pretty much in the first six to 12 months of their life. Then after that, they're kind of, I've had enough. It's sort of like, uh, they just run out of power. It's like like the Duracell bunny, it goes like the clappers and then stops when it runs out of energy. Um, I have found that some Chilean Sauvignon Blancs age remarkably well. One of my favorite New World Sauvignon Blancs in the world is produced by a company called Santa Rita, one of the oldest producers in Chile. And they have a, a vineyard called La Floresta. And Floresta Sauvignon Blanc is quite stunning. And I've drunk that eight or nine years old. It tastes like poo fume. It really does. Um, so I'm kind of uh, f crossing my fingers with this. But Ritual is um, is a company which is owned by the, the... I think it's owned by, if not just the distribution, um, the sherry giant Gonzalez Bias. Now, you don't need to... To, to watch all of my shows know how much I like Gonzalo's Bias because you'll notice in the sherry shows it's everywhere Tia Pepe probably one of the greatest value wines on earth um, but ironic that we were talking about brininess and sherry and this wine is actually um, a part of that same business wow well it's under screw cap which means that when Sauvignon Blanc ages under cork or under screw cap, two th different things happen depending on how much air you allow in the wine. The screw caps are rather clever. You can actually design the screw cap so that the washer inside allows lots of air in or doesn't allow any, any in at all and it's completely hermetic. And that would end up with two completely different results. Uh, there is a bit of oxygen in the headspace where the wine's bottled. That sometimes is enough for the wine to age, depending on the variety. But you are in danger of the wines kind of eating themselves up and going what we call reductive and a bit weird and losing their aroma. That has not happened here in any way. 
First of all, I just want to point out, it's 14% alcohol. Ain't mucking about. That's quite strong for a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, this one has a lovely, toasty, nutty smell, which reminds me of some actually quite premium New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs that have had chances to age. There's a spicy, toasty, almost like silver shred lemon marmalade on sourdough toast thing going on, which I think is really nice. That's delightful. <laughs> it's got lovely complexity. It's lost a lot of its juicy, juicy fruit puppy fat of its youth. And now it's got this wonderful, long tail of sleek acidity. It's like a, it's like an eel floating through your mouth. It's long and slinky. Holy moly, that's delicious. Right, I'm afraid I should have checked the prices beforehand, but I'm guessing if that wine's anything under £15, it's a bit of a bargain. Look it up. Um, I believe all these wines are available in the UK right now. But then look at the legend below. I would have put the information there. Well, that's chilli done. Okay, right. Fantastic. Who are we going to go to next? Mm -hmm. South Africa. South Africa. Well, we we'll talk about New Zealand. Let's do New Zealand next. Map of New Zealand. High res graphics from courtesy of Emma Russell, um, married to Joe Wadsack. We're very modern that way. Um, that's the top of the South Island of uh, of New Zealand, and you'll be able to see here. That's the capital of New Zealand. Or, no, it's not capital. It's the largest city. Apologies, everyone. Capitals of Wellington is further south. But um, what we've got here is the top of the South Island. On this side, on the west side, um, projecting out the Tasman Sea, you've got the area of Nelson. Very, very marine, very maritime, as you can imagine. But huge breezes of salt coming in all the time. Um, more protected is Marlborough, which is here, which is a bit further to the east, a bit further south, more protected by hills and mountains. Um, but both uh, famous for making phenomenally good and extremely reliable Sauvignon Blanc, but also a pile of shit as well. Um, like anyway, if you're going to make tons and tons and tons of wine, eventually there's a point at which maybe only 10% of it's any good. But 10% in any wine region, I'd take that. Um, so uh, let's have a look at uh, what should we start with Marlborough or Nelson Marlborough or Nelson ok well I'll show you the two wines we've got to show I think Nelson Ooh. let's try this first it's called Hollishaw Island 2020 Nelson um, there's a fantastic producer in Nelson I mean a really really amazing uh, producer um, called Neudorf um, Judy and Tim Finn Tom Fun, as in the same guy, same name as the guy that's in Crowded House. Um, Judy, Tim, and their lovely daughter, who spent a lot of time working in London, don't you know, um, are a wonderful winemaking family who are very kind, mega generous, but also make some of the finest wine in New Zealand, which then, by rote, actually, I don't mind saying some of the finest wine in the world. They make incredible Pinot Noir. They make incredible Chardonnay. What is often overlooked is they make a Sauvignon Blanc, which will quite easily age for 10 years. Uh, and I've drunk some very old ones. Uh, remarkable stuff, really. Um, so, Nelson, what's different from Nelson and Marlborough? Well, I said before, more of a, more, I suppose, a slightly more, uh, a, a more savage climate, slightly. More winds, more sleet, more whoosh, howly well, not sleet, but you know what I mean. Um, but also, because it's very close to the sea, I suppose quite a lot of New Zealand vineyards in Marlborough as well are. Um, it has um, quite a, a moderating uh, influence with the with the water, which comes right up to the shore. And this this is a vineyard very close to the Tasman Sea, right on the shores of Tasman Sea. Um, uh, the water acts as some kind of moderator. So when it's very very hot in the land, the water kind of will absorb some of that heat and take the heat down. And when it's cold inland and the water's warmer, it'll give back like a storage heater overnight, like an economy seven. Okay, so here we are, 2020, nice and young, nice and fresh. What have we got here? <laughs> if I smell that in a lineup of a hundred wines, a hundred Sauvignon Blancs, I'd go, that's from Nelson. I don't know why. It's not a question of ripeness. It kind of is, but it does have a smell. There's a vegetalness. Uh, I don't want to say celery because a lot of people hate celery. It's not really celery, but there's a a goose proper proper gooseberry smell to it. Real green gauge and gooseberry smell. That's it. Yeah, gooseberry pie all day long. 
gooseberry sorbet. Um, we don't eat gooseberries anymore. If you go down to the fruit collection at Brogdale, which is down in Kent, uh, you'll find out that they are trying to keep the gooseberry alive, and they've got something like 1,200 different variants of gooseberry. Nobody wants to do anything with them because they've got spikes on, which is a shame because it's extraordinarily nice fruit. Sleek, linear, not broad and fat. Very, very, yeah, very sleek. It's kind of... It's got an almost, oh, well, it's hard to say, very mouth-watering twang to it. It's got the kind of tang that you get out of sumac. Do you know what I mean? That herb or that spice. Um, or like um, there's this kind of salt that they have in Mexico for putting rivers and glasses, which has got chilli and lime, dehydrated lime extract. And it's got a lip-smacking pang to it. It's almost like sherbet. There you go. Gooseberry sherbet. That's what that's like. Absolutely delicious. There's more to it than that, though. I'm just trying to think, is that all there is? Behind that, there's a nice development of fruit. Kind of ripens up in the mouth. You get some fresh apple flavours, like pink lady apples. A um, little bit of guava, a little bit of mango. Anyway, very, very attractive wine. Um, New Zealand has the highest average price per bottle of any wine country in the world. Um, but if this wine is... 15 or less, I think that's very, very fair. If that's £12, that's a terrific glass of Sauvignon Blanc. So um, all is forgiven, New Zealand. Moving on to Framingham. This is made by a dude who I met a couple of times um, who makes incredible Riesling as well. And he's like one of the kings of, 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 uh, of Marlborough. And he's been making wine down at Framingham in Marlborough for as long as virtually any of the wineries have, exi have existed, almost as long as Cloudy Bay's existed, if not in fact even longer. Um, and I believe he's from Newcastle or Sunderland or somewhere like that. But I believe that he's Geordie Lake. Anyway, fantastic wine producer. I mean, his, every drop wine I've ever had from him has been either technically correct at the very, very least in difficult vintages to soaringly beautiful and pretty and delicious. Um, lots of fun stuff on... Uh, on the bottle it says here, rule number eight, maintain a bit of mystery. And it talks about the wine being um, aged in different things. And they've actually put this wine um, unusually, which is something that has happened quite a lot in France, in acacia barrels. Acacia wood is like oak, but not. Um, it doesn't steam, it's not as malleable, it's much, much whiter. It's very, very dense in, 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 in hardness fact. Um, and also it has a very, very pure vanilla character, even more vanilla-y than oak uh, staves are so they've they've um, gone to town with this wine trying to make something very serious and I can tell because it's 2019 vintage if you can see that because um, it's 2019 uh, um, this is a wine that's been held back intentionally I wouldn't say it was all barrel fermented I imagine about 10% of it is but also it comes from Wairau Valley which is where Cloudy Bay and the whole shit kicked off to start with back in the late 80s and early 90s uh very, very tropical fruit there in Waira. You got, there, there's a characteristic to the, to the fruit which I think is very recognisable. Uh, really passion fruity, really ripe and tropical. Like um, bongo for grown-ups. Little butchers. What have we got for us? Also, it says here, rule number one. Do what you love. Aren't I? Hey? <laughs> I am doing what I love. I love earning money more, but then, you know, shit happens. Anyway. Uh... No, no more information that I can read really there. Wow. Wow. Okay. So I started this with a very flippant, it's saving on Blanc Day today, so we'll just get on with it, shall we? Expecting to go through a lot of these wines and feel a little bit like, oh, well, they're, they're different and they've evolved a lot and Sauvignon Blanc as a category is far more sophisticated than it was even five years ago. But I wasn't expecting myself to enjoy myself this much. Uh, these wines are very good. Mm. Mm. I can taste the acacia. There's a creamy, almost resinous ferret coat in the gums characteristic. And it's like vanilla, but it's like vanilla panna cotta. There's like a buttermilk sourness to it. And a very strong taste of fennel. So almost aniseed. Might not appeal to everyone, but I think that's a rather clever wine. And a wine that would be stunning with Asian food. Now, that's a bit of a blanket statement. Let's pick something. Thai green curry. Thai green curry with Thai basil, which, this that's it. It's not aniseed, it's a taste of Thai basil. Um, 
tiger and curry with little, those little bitter um, uh, aubergine, pea aubergines in. Absolutely delicious. That would be stunning with that. Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand with a little bit of residual sugar works very, very well with tiger and curry anyway. That's almost like it was designed for it. Two very good Sauvignon Blancs. Where are we at? Well, I've got a feeling they're a bit more expensive uh, than the Carmen, those two wines. But I think they're both, I think in, in raw quality, quality terms, may marginally better than this. Although this is a really attractive and delicious wine. I know everything has to be um, the head of Mensa. Some, there's a time for this when I'm going, I don't care, we've got that in the rack. I want something like this. Um, but this fella over here is um, very sophisticated um, and has some maturity about it like yours truly um so i think these two I know these two are probably rocking it at the moment maybe the outside liars are so what have we got left well we've got three wines left first of all we'll tie off the whole news the whole new world idea with two south african sauvignon blogs and two of my absolute goddamn favorites as well which way around should i do this i don't know which way around to do this this one's probably got more prestige, so we'll do that second, I guess. Which is not fair, really, um, because this guy, super pioneer. Um, I've loved every Sauvignon Blanc this guy's ever made. A guy called Charles Hopkins. He's a big unit, and there's nothing he doesn't know about making modern Sauvignon Blanc. He, and he's invented a few tricks, too. Uh, de Crendel, um, Alzette de Preis, who used to be his winemaker, along with him, another genius um, who's taken uh, winemaking and and decided to become a mummy instead. Um, I remember uh, talking to her about how these wines are made, and there are some clever techniques which we'll come on to in a second. But let's start off with a map. Map, 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 map. Map, we have a map. Yes, we do have a map. This is the map of the South African wine-growing regions. Boom! Yeah, they're really close together. If you look right there, you've got basically Table Mountain is just to the west or to the left of the bottom cross that's constantia that's the second wine okay so if you go due north you're in cape town you're on the beach if you go further north you're up into a place where the big black cross is which was until recently mostly known as dio durbanville durban town which is a bit confusing because on this map Durban's flipping miles out here somewhere, the actual city of Durban. So Durbanville is a bit confusing to tourists, so what they've decided to call it now, that and some associated areas just uh, north there, is Dio Cape Town, because you're only 25 minutes from the city, you're 20 minutes from the airport there. Uh, unbelievably, you can be in drinking delicious Sauvignon Blanc, and they do make incredible Sauvignon Blanc in Dio Cape Town. Um, but... Um, Durbanville and its associated region of Darling, which is an even cooler climate, make the most delicious white wines. I really do believe that. And uh, I have um, also some very, very serious old red vineyards, Cabernet Sauvignons, Cabernet Franc, things like that. Um, but uh, just showing you the scale of the Cape Winelands and how, again, a bit like in Chile, the actual areas which are particularly suited to Sauvignon Blanc production can in some cases, particularly when you're talking large production, be a very, very specific place. You have to have a specific temperature change from morning to night during the year. You have to have a specific amount of sun hours. You have to have a specific temperature, specific amount of rainfall. Um, and you do find that Sauvignon Blanc comes from a small area which is then monopolised because it, you make more money out of Sauvignon Blanc than anything else. It's the, it's the most profitable wine there is. Probably costs about 50 pence to make a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc once you've bought the thing, bought the land and everything, and then you can sell it for a tenner. So, yeah, why wouldn't you? Okay, so this is the uh, the top cross, uh, D.O. Cape Town, uh, and De Crendel, Charles Hopkins Winery. Look at that. Uh, I think they're selling this in Waitrose right now. Look, it's slathered in prizes and awards and 90-plus points and stuff like that, which is a good sign before I pour up myself a little cheeky glass. Um, one of the things that he, that Elsa de Preis told me um, Charles invented was a thing called skin rubbing, where... They put the skins into the vat while the wine is soaking before it starts fermenting to extract some of the essential oils, kind of the body shop perfume of the skin of Sauvignon Blanc. But they also move them around so the skins actually rub together. So you notice that by doing that, it takes off some of the surface oil that's extracted through the osmotic pressure of the oil coming to the surface of the skin. But it doesn't rub off any tannin or any hardness or any bitterness. So it just basically accelerates that process and makes it even more pronounced. 
So you end up with a wine which is incredibly aromatic, incredibly tropical, and extremely mouth-walking and delicious. I drank this um, at a place called Mirandal in Dio Cape Town uh, many years ago. Uh, I think the first vintage I tried of De Crendel. It may have been his first vintage. Um, and um, we drank it with roast belly of pork and oak smoked mash. It was one of the nicest meals I've ever eaten. Oh, it's lovely. It's very lovely. That is, to me, the smell of South Africa off the plane. <coughs> get off the plane, get in a taxi. Right, take me there. When you get there, you just you don't say please or thank you. Just go, serve your block! And then they pour you a glass. After you go, I apologise for my brashness just then. Uh, but I needed to get my mouth washed with the right stuff. I can feel that rubbing. It's kind of a textural res oiliness to it, which is nice. Not... Not grubby, but just tangy, and it's got got more in it. Very ripe, very delicious. This is a twelve pound wine, there or thereabouts, um, an absolutely phenomenal value for money. I think quite delicious. Nice aftertaste, also. Just want to point out that it does say De Crendel was founded in seventeen twenty. Um, but Mr. Hopkins has been making wine that long. Um, he was at, I think, Stellenzich before there, or something, but a very famous winemaker across South Africa. Moving on to this, made by the young, mega talented Matthew Day, I think his name is. Um, and this is Klein Constantia. Klein Constantia is one of the most famous wineries in the world for many reasons. Not only that, if you really want credibility as a South African wine producer, then um, it would help if French people drank your wine, wouldn't it? Because you've got the French going, oh, no, 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 Sauvignon Blanc comes from France, it comes from the Loire, it comes from Bordeaux. Well, the largest drinker of Grand Constantia's dessert wine, Grand Constance de Constantia, was Napoleon, who bought literally thousands of litres of it a year, drank a bottle of it every single day. It was his favourite wine. A wine, yes, from South Africa. What vintage? Like anything between 1791 and 1815, he was buying. So there you go. Um, South Africa is not a new world country as people think it is. It's a very old one, if, if it is. Um, but Klein Constantia is famous for making some very good, very classy cabernets. Um, it's owned by uh, a consortium of, of other very fine winemaking producers. And almost every year when this comes out, you taste it and go, oh, how, how can you make it any better than that? It's perfect. Now, I always thought of this as the Sancerre or the Grand Sancerre or the Grand Prix Fumé of South Africa. Uh, 13.5% alcohol. This is 2020 as well, yeah, so they're both the same vintage. Pristine silver white colour. Ah, so refreshing. I believe they make a kind of a single estate, single vineyard wine above this now. But that wine has such concentration, such length and follow through. It has the acidity of a wine from the Loire, like Sancerre or Pufume. But it has the power and ripeness of a wine from Bordeaux. I mean, one of the really big ones. If you think about the great white wines from Pessac Lyonnais, which is south of Bordeaux, the area which we used to know lovingly, the whole area is Grave. Uh, and they make some of the best white wines in the world there, certainly the best white wines in France. Um, it's the region which probably produces the most wine that's competitive in quality anyway to white Burgundy, which is made from Chardonnay. But the white wines of Pessat saint Leonion made from Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon make fantastic wines, which in some cases age for decade upon decade. I mean, Haute Brion Blanc, white wine from Haute Brion, yeah, it's like a thousand euros a bottle. Uh, one of the most sought after wines on earth. Um, this wine has something of the power of the latent power of those wines which is extraordinary um it it speaks quite softly it's got a slight nutty richness to it very old vine i think for the re for, for south africa anyway um the vines were replanted after apartheid in 1994 so you know you're now looking at vineyards which could potentially be knocking on the door of 30 years old which makes a massive difference to the quality of the wine Pretty special stuff. God, it wouldn't be fair to put these in any order of quality, actually, thinking about it. Let's try this Carmen again. 
Well, that tastes like water now, if I'm honest. <laughs> but it's probably half the price of this. Bear that in mind. Um, but a lovely, soft, easy drinking wine. Lovely and briny. Perfect foil for any kind of food. Nice and neutral. Great with soap, with tomato salads. tomato curries. Fantastic. Um... I thought this one was an absolute blinder as well. Well done, uh, Mr. Framingham. I can't remember his name. It's Dave, I can't remember. Anyway, um, but here you are. Uh, it's Sauvignon Blanc Day, and we've done six uh, New, Ze uh, New World wines, uh, two from South Africa, two from Chile, two from um, uh, New Zealand, which just leaves me a few minutes to talk about this country here. Yeah. Back to France. If you see where the cross is, it's almost dead centre. It's almost a bullseye in France. This is southwest of a place called Bourges. If you go northeast of Bourges, the same distance, onto the Loire River, you are in Sancerre and Puy Fumé, which is the kind of Bethlehem of super premium Sauvignon Blancs. This wine has been around a lot longer, though. This is, thank you, Daniel Lambert, a 2019 very ripe vintage. So I, I think in this lineup, I, I thought it would look really exciting to try this wine because 2019 was a very ripe year and the wines tasted remarkably new world and tropical like this. But Cassie, Cassie and Lee are two um, appellations just down there, sort of a little, a little further out, a little less known than the Sancerre and Puy Fumé, a lot less, lo less known. But um, uh, there was a decree to grow wine in Cancer that goes back to the early 1200s, if not the 12th century itself. Um, one of the oldest uh, wine regions, certainly one of the oldest places on earth to ever grow Sauvignon Blanc. And Daniel, very kindly, has sent me a couple of cases of wines to try over the summer uh, to fit into my shows. Um, I've tasted a few, uh, and I'm going to do a couple, bit of a post out on uh, Instagram about a couple of the absolute bangers. Uh, but if you don't know Daniel Lambert Wines, look him up. Um, he's from down, um, not Swansea specifically, but he's down in, in Wales and is has his ability to find uh, inexpensive, delicious premium Bordeaux's and delicious, inexpensive, premium white burgundy, even in the climate we're in today financially, um, uh, is astonishing. Uh, Daniel has amazing talents, um, and uh, I want you to recommend. I want you to try his wines. He makes, some, uh, does a good line in Beaujolais too, and New World wines. Um, he has Holic, which is one of the great Kunawara producers. Uh, I tried his Cabernet Sauvignon yesterday. Oh, mm, mon Dieu! Mwah. Cassis La Carante. It was lovely. Anyway, so this is a Cancy 2019 called Les Nouza, uh, which I think probably means uh, shellfish or some like when it, it's got one of those things, those nautilus things. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, again, just the fact that Daniel sent this to me. Uh, I have got such confidence it's going to be delicious that I haven't tried this yet. And I uh, just want to see how it stacks up against our New World offering here. You never fail, Buster. Never fail, Daniel. Good work, fella. Wow. OK, so what am I smelling? Well, one thing that's very clear. It has the tightness and reservation of this wine, which I think is probably the most concentrated of the six. That's a wonderful perfume, like waxy white flowers, acacia blossom, magnolia. Beautiful smells. A little bit of the soil. You can really smell a sense of where it is. I can smell a kind of a slight dusty clay loam soil, possibly. Silky. It's like silk. Absolutely delicious, my friend. Oh, I'm imagining this is probably more like in a 16, 17 pound kind of touch. But if it's not, look below. Because every time I recommend his wines, I overprice them. So uh, have a look. Very sexy looking bottle. Started where we finished, right back in France. So, <laughs> two New Zealand wines, two Chilean wines, two South African wines, one French wine. See you next time for a show on Bulgarian Rakia. Thank you.